This video is taken from a series of 8mm movie film filmed back in the mid to uh, late 50s while fishing on in Kodiak Island uh, in Alaska, commercial fishing. And uh, the quality is not good, but uh, hopefully it will make some sense. These, these videos were just recently completed and they're 40 some years of age with respect to the eight millimeter stuff. Here is our PAFCO fleet uh, at uh, Bellingham, Washington. Pacific American Fisheries Company. These boats were numbered accordingly. Uh, there was uh, my boat, PAFCO number 10, on uh, which Larry was a crew member. That was Larry you just saw a moment ago in the foreground there. Ed and I and Larry used to uh, frequently go down to the uh, PAF, as we called it, cannery, and watch on the progress of the boat. This is at the Anacortes Far West Dock when uh, my dad, Dick Malath, was leaving for his summer fishing in Alaska. That's our 55 uh, Chevrolet in the foreground and there's Dick with the gray shirt on. One of the boats pulling away from the dock Traditionally, all these uh, trips started on a Sunday afternoon where there were a number of uh, well-wishers uh, uh, down at the docks waving goodbye to their friends, relatives. There is the St. Bernadette, the vessel that I spent so many years fishing on in the 40s and 50s. There it is, lovely old boat, great sea boat. And there's Dick with the gray jacket. Another vessel pulling away. The quality of the film here is not good, but given the fact that these are very old 8 millimeter movie film, uh, I'm feeling uh, somewhat pleased that they turned out as well as they did. There's the Brigadier making a turn, getting ready to make their circle out in the channel and then pass by the dock, waving and at the same time blowing their horns as each vessel went by one at a time and the well-wishers on the dock waving back. There's Carolyn after the boats have left, carrying the camera case. And the boats are heading off, generally taking anywhere from eight to 10 days to go to Kodiak from here. This is our PAFCO fleet leaving from the port dock at Anacortes. Uh, again, on a Sunday, I, I believe that this particular day there were something like 14 boats all at once that were traveling all together up to Kodiak for the summer season. You, uh, you will see a great number of people on the dock gathered up there waving goodbye to us as we leave for a three-month stay fishing in the waters, commercial fishing, in the waters of Kodiak Island. A lot of folks down there. Goodbye to Anacortes for the next three months. You'll notice later on in the film that uh, there are scenes from a couple of different salmon fishing years up there. Um, and I had to splice them together in order to make uh, one complete set showing a an actual set being made 
And this is Waterfall, where we stop for a, a little rest and relaxation on the way to Alaska. This is in southeast Alaska. And a beautiful setting there, but somewhat wet and damp at all times. There's the suspension bridge. Larry doing a little dance there, kind of like. The rest of my crew members gathered up along there. It's a very pretty scene. Lovely stream here. Of course, very wild. Running hard. It drops off and forms the waterfall at the, uh, there's our boats up in the upper center. Larry, uh, on the suspension bridge, lighting up the smoke, and doing a little jig on the way there. Orland Shank. And, uh, and this is me, I, I, I guess that's me, I, it must be because the arms are waving and I'm, I'm talking, I guess. Back in those days, everyone smoked. There's one of my crew members off on a little fly fishing expedition there, and uh, I don't recall that he was successful, but he's uh, given it a fair try on this uh, very pretty stream. We're just entering the, the Gulf of Alaska, leaving Cape Spencer under unusually lovely conditions for the Gulf of Alaska right now. Uh, we're just leaving the last of land for uh, the next three days and nights. And off to our right is Mendenhall Glacier. We'll be leaving all sign of, uh, of landfall very shortly and won't see anything until we're uh, literally in Kodiak. Good weather, good traveling weather. You can see our stabilizers are out holding us uh, in a little better a little better position not quite so not quite so rough for us keeps us from rocking side to side also slows us down a bit however present uh, albatross always around a good crossing for the Gulf of Alaska this can be and is usually a very nasty stretch of water. There was our tender, the Saturn. And here we are uh, pulling into Alatak Bay, Lazy Bay in uh, the southern portion of uh, Kodiak Island. This will be more or less our home for the next three months. Fishing out of here, returning on a weekly basis to the cannery for uh, provisions and uh, repairs and whatever. There's Al Bastetich and Larry Lunsford working on the boat that Al was on, working on their net. They had their little uh, jitney net operation there, and uh, we did as well. They needed to do some repairs, and so they used our boat to put their net on while they were repairing, and we were both underway there, tied up side to side, as you can see. Bob Saparvich in the upper left. There always is a great deal of cooperation between boats, in so far as it can be done, and this was just one of those cases in where 
we were able to lend assistance and uh, we're glad to do so. That is our little jitney there we're towing along with our skiff, the jitney's uh, a small seine boat. And we did a little octopus uh, fishing and I'm cleaning one up there. And we see we got some razor clams, which uh, were plentiful, other clams, butter clams, steamers, and everything else as well. Always had access to lots of good seafood. That's one of the things I think most all of us miss so very much about not being in the commercial fishing industry any longer. There's a picture of our, or one of our fleet's boats being lifted up on the waves for some uh, repairs to the hull or whatever. They, uh, the cannery had its own machine shop, of course, and its own ways. Here we uh, ran hard aground. I, I ran us hard aground on the eastern island, eastern end of the island, and we're stuck on a reef. The skiff is towing on us to no avail. Uh, Nick Chikorodich came by in his boat, threw a line on us, and towed and towed and towed, and fortunately the tide was coming in all the time, and eventually we were pulled free and were able to go back about our business of fishing. Busted up the keel substantially and had to uh, go in for repairs that weekend, uh, which we fixed up, and uh, here we are getting away from the reef after all, backing out with the tow line, fixed up the keel and uh, best we could and then went back fishing. There's Skip Moore, one of our skiff men. And there's the boat that Al and Ray and Bob Sparvich were on. Their little, uh, uh, little boat, li little Libby boat, had a reel on it. They were very uncommon back in those days, very early uh, stages of the reel development actually in the um, salmon industry. By this time, most everyone had power blocks, but reels were still kind of a novelty. And here we are with the PAFCO 10 up on the ways at the cannery, and uh, I'm looking over the bottom and seeing what needs to be done. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get it uh, fixed up as best we could at least and at least keep the net from getting fouled up on the, this, uh, the splintered uh, keel skag. We were able to fix that up and then get back into the water and went back out fishing again the, uh, as soon as the uh, season was open again on the following Monday. That's Tom Johnson in the checkered shirt, the cannery superintendent, conversing with me as to uh, what we need to be doing. And we go back down into the water, having completed our, our temporary, at least, repairs. There is the, uh, the Indian and the Filipino bunkhouses where the crews, cannery crews themselves, lived during the, can uh, during the uh, salmon season. There's Larry Lunsford working on a lead line there and getting a little unusual and rare sunshine on his body not too frequent on Kodiak Island. 
always something to do, so the weekends were always uh, fairly busy with uh, repairs, maintenance, and all kinds of things that just need to be done. This was an especially good crew I had here. Larry was uh, one of my crew members, outstanding crewman, knew how to fish, knew what and what not to do, and that makes a great, a great deal of difference when you have a good crew that knows uh, how to work. Gordon Shank working on something there, and there's a skiff man, Skip Moore, taking care of the engine changing the oil and doing all the kinds of things that need to be done in order to ensure good uh, running equipment at all times. Everything needs to be working and working right in order to make a successful salmon season. And there I am uh, repairing a brailer. And the brailer is an uh, instrument used to pull fish out of the net and drop them into the hatch of the boat, the hold of the boat. It's one of our jetneys, as I described earlier, used as a small per seine boat on very, very shallow water, actually uh, right up on the beach, where the bigger nets and the bigger boats could not get. There we are bringing in a load of uh, king crab. The cannery had a couple of traps there located in the bay for its fishermen to use. Take out what you want, rebate the trap, put it back in for the next person. And we uh, always had a plentiful supply of king crab on hand, something I am dearly missing right now. Took what we wanted and uh, and then, uh, as I said, rebated the trap and put it back in for the next passersby. King crab were very plentiful around there at that time, and this was actually prior, just prior to the, the great king crab uh, uh, explosion up there that uh, really took off in the early 60s, and lots and lots of dollars were made in, uh, in those years in that industry. And lots and lots of boats were involved, too. And here we are. Uh, a couple of the guys are cleaning the king crab, breaking the shells off on the davit, and, uh, and then just keeping the leg and body section. And we'll cook those all up, steam them, and they'll be wa wonderful eating. There we are in a set. The skiff is uh, pulling on the boat, keeping us away from the net while we're bringing the net in. And this is the power block operation. And the skiff is uh, a very important part of this whole operation, and a good skiff man is indeed a valued uh, employee. Larry hanging uh, leads and skip doing the rings. And there are, I believe, Larry and Skip in the skiff on the beach while we're in a set, getting ready now to close up the end of the net, which will come forward towards the boat, wherein the boat and the skiff will approach each other. And the net is in a big uh, circular fashion out around the outside. At the right time, the skiff throws its end of the net up to the boat. The boat then starts the pursing operation, bringing the bottom of the net closed tightly together. Here we're having a little impromptu barbecue on the beach. And uh, Skip Moore there does a little bit of a, a dance for us. I don't know why we weren't attacked by brown bears with all that meat smell around there at that particular time, but we were... Uh, we were not bothered in any way, and there are a lot of bear on Kodiak Island. So we had a little uh, afternoon barbecue there. As I recall, this was on a Sunday afternoon, and fishing was not permitted anyhow, so we took advantage of the fact that the sun was shining, and 
and we add some meat and the barbecue utensils. Here again is another shot of the skiff towing on the, on the boat, keeping it in proper position during the pursing operation. So that the uh, boat does not get in, the net does not get entangled into the boat during that, uh, that pursing time. That, that is a complicated uh, event and uh, one to be avoided if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible and uh, you have to pay the consequences. When the net is all pursed up, then the uh, go through the power block up there as you see and uh, it's piled down onto the deck of the boat in exact order so that it does not uh, uh, get fouled up on the way out the next set. Another one of the boats, I believe this was the Seafarer. And uh, there we are, traveling again. Stabilizer poles out. Good seas. And here we are uh, looking at some icebergs in the water, and those are certainly something that uh, you pay attention to and watch out for, especially at nighttime because they are rather substantial and uh, can do grievous injury to your vessel should you strike one. Very dense ice on these icebergs. Passing by a freighter on the way. A lapse in the, uh, in the filming here. Uh, here we are starting the sequence showing a set. Here the skiff men are hooking themselves to the net. And uh, the scenes are from, uh, from Alaska and here in the Sound. As you can see, Carolyn is on board the boat with us this particular day. The skiff man uh, lets the lead go. At a certain signal from the skiff man, this pin is pulled, this large pin is pulled. And then the skiff and the boat separate and the net comes off the boat. And you'll watch uh, Larry raise his arm back there when it's time to pull the pin. The pin is pulled at the right time, and the net starts now to come off the stern of the main boat. A dangerous operation at this point. Uh, when you let that net out, it's very easy to get somehow ensnarled in it and uh, get pulled overboard. So you, you have to stay a very, very clear of everything that's moving. Now we're going to go into what is called a tow operation. The net is uh, on the boat side here is picked up slightly so that uh, the boat can maneuver around under it. Slowly the boat then makes a little uh, progress toward the skiff in a circular fashion. This is called the tow and it can be anywhere from just minutes to an hour long depending upon how the skipper, how long the skipper wants to tow the net, and depending upon how the fish are running. Here comes the skiff now, closing up its end of the net, coming toward the boat. The boat then, as I said earlier, the, uh, will receive the end of the net from the skiff, and the boat will then have both ends and will start the pursing operation and that is pulling the rings together on the bottom of the net so as to not allow the fish to escape. The skiff now uh, uh, has made itself clear of its end of the net. 
and we'll go back and pick up the lead, which is a small net in the stern end of the of the uh, skiff. There they are picking up the Montero buoy. They'll start pulling the the lead back into the boat, and then we'll return back to the boat for further duties on, in the operation of uh, bringing the net in. And there you can see the skiff men pulling in the lead. And again, it has to come in in a special way, uh, just like the net does, in order to uh, not foul things up on the next set. This is the purse lines and they are coming in from a winch that is uh, closing up the bottom of the net very quickly and uh, eventually all the bottom of the net will be closed as it is here the rings are lifted high in the air the lead line is straightened out and laid down accordingly and then the uh, process of bringing the net back aboard the boat begins Larry there in the skiff backing out to do his tow duties. Skip uh, left the boat, uh, left the skiff and is now up on the boat doing some other kinds of work up there as needed. It's a very busy operation once you're into a set like this. The net now starts to come up through the power block and we'll come down onto the, toward the stern end of the boat, at which point the crew members will all um, begin piling the net in proper fashion. There goes the net up into the power block. Once in a while, fish get gilled in the net, and this is uh, not a usual event, but uh, it's, it's kind of a nuisance. You have to stop and take the fish out as they get gilled. Normally, the fish are not caught in this manner. They're caught at the end of the net as it's being pulled in at the very bitter end. There the fish are all gathered up and are then brailed out of the net. And that brailing is a big scoop uh, an operation that you'll see in a few moments, the big scoop that dips down into the net from the winch and the mast or the boom of the boat, and then is uh, pick, picking the fish out of the net and dropping them into the hold. And there you see we are laying the net down in proper fashion on the stern of the vessel, again, so as to make certain that it's all uh, in proper uh, alignment and arrangement so as not to create a problem on the next set out. There's the power block in operation. This has been a, a wonderful uh, advent to the, to the fishing industry. Prior to this, the nets were all pulled by hand, literally right out of the water by hand, which was a backbreaking and tedious operation. The advent of the power block allowed us to make many more sets and uh, be a lot less tired at the end of the day. Always some repairs that need to be made, so periodically we have to stop the operation and fix things as we see that they're uh, needing to be taken care of. Sewing the net there must have had a big hole there. Now the skiff comes next to the boat and the very end of the net and is getting ready to, to uh, braille the fish out of the net. Now you look closely, you can see the fish swimming around in there. This is where a good skiff man is really an asset. He can uh, uh, load that brailer very full with the uh, proper technique. And a good full brailer is, uh, makes work uh, a lot quicker and a lot easier. And the brailer is now going into the water. It's in the water there. 
and we're pushing uh, the grater is now going down into the water as I said we're going to be pushing the other end pulling the other end of the net forward toward the brailer causing the fish to go forward and into the brailer. The winch then, this right signal, lifts uh, the brailer up and, uh, and uh, the boom hauls it over the hold and the fish are dropped into the hold. You go back in then with another brailer attempt, start filling the brailer all over again. The more times you do this, the happier you are because that means you've gotten a, a sizable number of fish in the net during that set. Up comes another brailer and down into the hold. Another brailer. The bottom of the brailer is let loose and then the, uh, the fish just fall right out of the braille. There's Larry pulling the end of the net in and really loading up the brailer at this point, getting a nice big full brailer uh, to go into the hold. And up comes a brailer, and that's a good one. Another brailer full. And then we unload the fish each day onto the tenders. This is one of the tenders and it goes to the cannery and it loads its fish, uh, unloads its fish from here up a conveyor channel there into the cannery where they are, where they are processed for canning. And this is a uh, scene taken at Humpy Cove, uh, actually at Humpy Creek at Humpy Cove. So my crew and I went up to the creek to see what kind of uh, fish there were in there. And, and you can see them uh, uh, trying to make their way upstream. It's quite a sight watching these fish return to their, uh, to their native stream each year, each uh, cycle. This guy is trying to get a close-up picture of uh, one of those fish, and the fish is not being cooperative at all, but definitely wants to make it upstream.
This is a, uh, a shot of Ketchikan, Alaska. Here we are again cleaning some uh, some good fresh king crab. Just a wonderful delicacy, especially when it's as fresh as it is while we're up there fishing. This is our uh, Canneries airplane that it charters every year. It's used to by the cannery for uh, the purposes of uh, scouting out where the fish are gathered up on the weekends. So they would take the uh, the skippers uh, six or eight at a time and fly around all of Kodiak Island for a couple of hours and try to determine uh, where the best spot to be uh, will be for the next uh, opening, which would be on a Monday morning. So we would uh, we would fly around the island and uh, and visually see where the best spots would be for us to go to. And the plane is seen taken off. This is not a particularly good picture, and I apologize for that. However, as I said, these are uh, very seriously old film. That is the daring. That uh, particular vessel. Uh, I've got it on pause right now. The skipper of that vessel, Skip Reed, had uh, fallen overboard from there shortly before that, and the crew couldn't find him, and after about 20 minutes, they, they radioed me and the rest of the crew, rest of the fleet, and we turned around and started looking for him. We looked for him for uh, several hours. Uh, never were able to recover the body, there were about 10 or 12 boats that fanned out and immediately started a search uh, to no avail. Uh, Ray Reed was uh, lost at sea uh, in that particular event. This was just uh, as we were leaving Kodiak, heading back for uh, home in Anacortes. A sad event, but... Uh, one of those things in that industry that's uh, inevitable. Now here I really screwed up because I filmed over the same roll twice, uh, something that you shouldn't have to think too much about not doing, but apparently for some reason or other, I had my head in the wrong place and refilmed over a roll of exposed film. So if you, uh, you should pay careful attention, you look in the background and you can see the, uh, the boat in the background, or the boats in the background are having just a little bit more sea than the uh, nice pleasant picture that you see here in the foreground right now. Not good quality, but it's there. And you can see the, the boat in the background there is uh, taking a little weather. And uh, not uh, unusual weather. You, you fish that kind of weather or you don't fish much up there. But I elected to keep the film and just show it uh, even though it's uh, devil exposed. traveling from one point to another for during the day for for uh, fishing going to a different fishing ground at this particular time and that's the kind of thing you encounter on a daily basis there's one of the sardine boats in the foreground the victory they were larger vessels and fish sardines right in the same area that we were fishing salmon
Another picture of one of our uh, one of our boats underway. Looks like we're really making time there, but actually we're only doing about eight knots. And that uh, equates to about 10 miles an hour. It takes a little while to get from point A to point B. There's the the old Russian Orthodox Church on Cape Carlock. And a native hut there. Here we are, uh, Ed Barcott and I went out doing some octopus hunting one day. We put a little sack of uh, Bull Durham type bag of bluestone, copper sulfate, tied it onto a string and put it into the, the little hole under the rock where we suspect an octopus is hiding and wait for the bluestone to dissolve and irritate his eyes and then he'll come out through his uh, back door escape hatch. They always have a, uh, an escape hatch and you'll, <clears throat> you'll see him coming out there. Now you don't dare make a move for him now because if he senses any difficulty out there he's going to go back in again and you'll just literally have to pull him apart in order to get him out. So here he's about ready to get caught now. He's, his tentacles are pretty much free of any grabbing rocks or anything. And there he is. He's a nice one, just about the right size, probably five, six pound. Excellent eating, believe it or not. And uh, very plentiful, along with uh, all the other things, razor clams and all kinds of seafood. And here we are coming back, uh, Ed carrying a bucket of clams there. And he takes a little slip right here and almost goes down. Catches himself. Uh, not not uh, And here we are. We've uh, actually beached the boat here ourselves because we hit a dead head did damage to the propeller, and we had to beach the boat in order to pound the propeller back into some reasonable degree of, uh, um, of shape, as we could only get about one quarter of the speed because of the heavy vibration. We did manage to, uh, to make it uh, somewhat well again until we were able to get it properly uh, cleared up uh, later on in the season. The, uh, we beached the boat at high tide and let the tide go out and get our work done, and then <clears throat> wait for the tide to come back in again and refloat us. There's a picture of uh, what's left of Frank Surian's boat that blew up while he was uh, fueling with gasoline. Uh, gasoline and boats are uh, a very dangerous combination, but thankfully nobody was hurt. They were all blown into the water, but that's what's left of his boat up on the beach. that has been uh, washed ashore after blowing up and burning. As I recall, Frank got another little boat from his cannery and uh, continued the season. And here we are once again doing another one of our little barbecues on the deck this time as we're, as we're traveling. And uh, we're pretty near the end of this uh, series of film with uh, fishing in Kodiak. That is the end. <clears throat> and uh, I apologize again for the condition of the film, but uh, again, bear in mind these are very, very old films.